right. Good morning, everybody, and thanks. Thank you very much for the invitation. I wanted to give a little shout out to Dara as well because uh, she didn't actually tell you all the things that she does. Uh, she, uh, along with being a mom of two people with CF and uh, running the fab, she also works on, on my team at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, oversees a good chunk of our research. So, uh, Dara, I'm not sure when you're sleeping, and I know it's a team effort there, so I, I anyway. Okay, you got good. I said the next hour would be a great time to catch up. I think exactly. Um, and uh, Emily, thank you for inspiring us. That was wonderful. It was really, really great. So what, um, what I want to do in this time is actually sort of about half the time to, to tell a little bit about why things are exciting in science right now, but then the other half to be able to answer some questions. And so hopefully you can make this interactive as we go and not just talking at, at you. I think one of the goals that I'd like to have during this time is that you can see we're getting closer and closer and, and the advances that we're making so that hopefully the story that Emily told so effectively is something that could be more the norm rather than just uh, something that we feel like, oh, that's, that's great, but what about, what about me? And that also this would be something, you know, hopefully that we would actually see in this upcoming year or two for the vast majority of people with CF, maybe even up to 90% or more of people with cystic fibrosis. And at the same time, to hear in more detail about how we're going to make sure that this is the story for everybody. Okay? Looking at you, Laura Gordon. Um, so, all right. Um, so let's go. Uh, you know, 2018, this is, it's sort of fun to come to these things, right? Because every year we say, hey, it's been a big year in research. There's very few diseases where you can actually do that. But cystic fibrosis, it's true. Every year you come and you say, oh, it's been an amazing year. And guess what? 2018 was an amazing year. So we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about how 2019, there's even better things ahead, really amazing things, and talk about the, the details there. So I thought we could just talk about a couple of, uh, listed five things as I was putting this together. That, so we're talking about CFTR modulators. Emily gave us the the, uh, the ground level view of exactly what the effects of highly effective modulators can be. Um, so Kaleidico for G551D, but we want to try to make that experience for more and more people. We'll talk about that. I think we also want to talk about what I call some of the treatments of tomorrow. This is going to, how we're going to make sure that we can have everybody have this, this story. And we have some more work to do, but we've been, you know, laying the groundwork now so that this can be the story for everybody with cystic fibrosis. And um, there's also been a big year for infection. And we'll talk about some of the efforts there. Um, Anti-inflammatories, another big focus recently. And then lastly, just a little hodgepodge of a couple other things that I thought you might enjoy hearing about. So let's start off with just sort of review of some of the things that happen in, um, uh, actually, Emily. Um, that uh, in, in 2018 in that modulator space. Remember modulators, what we call CFTR modulators, are medicines which help to either restore the function of or turn on the function of the cystic fibrosis protein that lines all the, the cells of our, of our lungs, basically all the tubes of our bodies, our intestines, our sinuses, and in cystic fibrosis this protein isn't working. And so the modulators in different ways either turn that on or restore that function. And so 2018, uh, there was a couple of neat things in this whole area of CFTR modulators. In previous times, we've heard about how Kaleidoco came along and Orcambi, um, and that was something that was allowed or that was enabling more and more people to be treated. But I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that jumped out in 2018. And this is actually in sort of chronicle, uh, in order here. So um, one of these things is the Kaleidoco story, which Emily was talking about. We want to make sure that that's something we can start not just when you're an adult or just when you're a teenager, but to keep treating younger and younger, right? And the reason this is so important is, just think about it, is if, if you had started Kaleidoco at a young age, you'd never had pockets in your lungs that collect mucus and, you know, to be able to prevent that whole uh, thing that we call cystic fibrosis lung disease, right? So the, the vision for all of these is to treat early enough so that people hopefully would never develop scarring in their lungs. And that's actually becoming more and more of a reality. So Kaleidoco in 2018 is approved down to age, down to age one now. And this is, this is what we've been aiming for, right? And I can tell you that there's plans to try to go even lower than that. Now you might say, well, why do you need to go so carefully? Well, it turns out that things like the liver are very different when you're that small and how you clear medication. So there's a lot of being careful in studies as you get down lower and obviously you have to find the right doses. But that's the vision for everything we talk about is eventually all these medications would be treated from the very first time you realize, oh, I have cystic fibrosis to try to prevent problems. 
Um, so Kaleidico obviously has been around for over five years now, and that's the, the one that focuses on a subset of mutations of about 10 to 15 percent of people with cystic fibrosis. Um, the other one which we'd heard about over the last couple of years, or can be, which treats the most common type of cystic fibrosis, f 58 del f 58 del what we call f 58 del homozygotes, that's been moving down to younger and younger ages as well. So that was actually approved for age two to five in 2018. Again, supporting this whole vision of treat early, prevent disease. And then the last part, and, and I almost feel like it's old news because we've been talking about it for so long and there are probably some people whose loved ones are on this or maybe somebody online, um, that Simdico was approved. And so remember, I just remind what Simdico is, is Simdico is a little different version of Orcambi, a little cleaner version of Orcambi that treats people, for the most part, that have the most common type of cystic fibrosis, the f 508 del homozygotes. The advantages of this are that it doesn't have some of the side effects, some of the chest tightness that have been seen in, a couple, in some of the people with Orcambi. Um, but so these were just things which, in some ways, we've almost taken for granted. These are great things, getting younger, getting some better medications. Um, but I think what we've all been focusing in on is saying, we want to have this be something that can treat the vast majority of people with cystic fibrosis. And I think the most exciting thing of 2018, and probably everybody on the care teams would all agree, would be starting to see data that suggests that the exact story that Emily was telling and that we were hearing about could potentially um, affect up to 90% of people with cystic fibrosis. And that's because this triple therapy, and so the triple therapy which you hear about is basically Ivacaftor or Kaleidico um, plus Tezacaftor, so that's the other component in Simdico. Those are the two, two drugs that are already approved that people can be treated with, but they've only really been strong enough to treat people with two f 508 del mutations. And even then, it's sort of a modest improvement. It's not a Kaleidico experience. We're talking about something that's a couple percent improvement and some stabilization, but not the oh my gosh thing that we were hearing about. Well, it turns out that the addition of a third drug to those two drugs is really synergistic. So that one plus one plus one equals 10, instead of one plus one plus one equals three. And we've seen this in DISH. We've shown slides here before in the past about how this triple combination is strong enough to potentially treat anybody with a single f 508 del mutation, whether even if you just have one, that's 86.5% of everybody in the United States with cystic fibrosis, okay? Um, and so um, that looked great in the dish, but the real question is when you get this one plus one plus one into people with cystic fibrosis, do they get that oh my gosh experience? And the answer from what we saw in the phase two data is yes. Um, based on the phase two data. So I'm just going to go through this because I think this, uh, I'm not going to give you a lot of numbers and graphs today, but this is one that I think it was, it's worthwhile knowing the details. So um, there's a couple of different versions of the triple, all right? Uh, Vertex has basically narrowed this down now to two versions of the triple. One is basically Simdico plus 659. The other one is Simdico plus 445. These two drugs are very, they're based on the same scaffold. They're related. Um, and they're just trying to figure out which one works best. So there's two different, uh, there was two different trials um, that looked at this three drug combination. And I'm going to just show you the data for people that just have a single F5 weight del mutation. So this was a single F5 weight del mutation. The other one was a mutation that we know makes no protein. We call them minimal function. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't make any protein to be able to, to modulate. So really what we're seeing is we know just the effects on a single F5 weight del mutation. Make sense? Um, so here's what happened um, after uh, just a month. That the triple combination, the 659 triple combination, that patients with just the single F5 weight del mutation, their FEV1 went up 13%, absolute. So that's not a relative, that's from 50 to 63.3, you know, or 60 to 73.3. Um, that there was a 50 millimole drop in sweat chloride. Remember that sweat chlorides are probably around 100 in cystic fibrosis. The lower, the better, you know, normal. Would, um, when you start getting into that 40 range, you're talking about something where you don't even have cystic fibrosis by this. That, that these sweat changes, even in people with just the single F508 del mutation, was down into the 50 range. Um, and that the quality of life, this is sort of that switch that we were hearing about, like, oh my gosh, I feel a lot better. Quality of life jumped up 25 points. I know 20, what does 25 points mean? 
Well, we think a change of four points is actually uh, clinically significant. People can actually fill four. This changed 25 points. We've just never seen anything like this before. And so it's almost the identical experience. I won't go through the exact details. You can look at them here, but almost identical experience with 445. One of the things that's very comforting about that is that anytime you see reproducibility of results, you start to say, okay, this, is, this probably is real. The other thing is that you're always worrying through drug development is could there be some weird side effects or something that suddenly stops the program. The more versions you have, and actually Vertex started out with four and they've gone down to these two, the more versions you have, the more likely it is it's gonna make it all the way home. So, you know, this sounds great. Where to from here? Um, I think a couple key messages. One is, again, with the results we're seeing, it's not going to really matter what the second mutation is. If you have f 508 del don't get too caught up with trying to look through the, the other mutations and do I qualify in this trial or that trial because when the dust settles, this is really a, a, these are studies to, to demonstrate that it's strong enough to work for just a single f 508 del I didn't present the results from the, from the homozygous patients, the two f 508 del mutations, but they had very similar results but that was actually on top of Simdico. So that trial didn't look compared to placebo. It was Simdico, plus you add this much, and they had a big improvement as well. So they truthfully may even have more benefit than this, and this is pretty darn good, right? So the phase three trials have started uh, they're, they're for both 445 and 659. The 659, um, maybe I'll uh, jump to the next trial, tell you a little bit about what to expect in 2019, but those trials are now going to phase three, which is really that last step before uh, Vertex would go to the FDA and said, hey, will you approve this drug for everybody to have access for? I'll just mention, though, that as exciting as these data are, Vertex isn't the only um, company in the space. They're ahead, and that's great. We're rooting for them to go as fast as possible. Um, but there's two other companies, uh, Proteostasis, which actually announced some results from their triple combination, as well as AbbVie, another big company. And we want to have other companies that are in this. We want the best drugs to move forward. We want the best scientists fighting each other to, to be able to move forward, right? That's, that's, we want them focused on cystic fibrosis. So let's just think about 2019. Uh, what, what do we expect? And I put goals up here because any time you're talking about uh, you know, drug development, you have to be a little careful, right? You never want to count the chickens before they've all come home to roost. But certainly the data so far is really promising. So again, the goal for 2019 is that this triple combination would end up really demonstrating effectiveness for whether you have a single F5 weight Dell or two. Um, that, as I mentioned, the 659 trial is actually fully enrolled, and the initial readout from that's actually be in the next month. So we're going to actually see the phase three results for the 659 trials, or at least the first readout, um, in, uh, by the end of the year. And then the 445 trial, that second trial, is, uh, should be fully enrolled by uh, the end of the year, and that initial readout would be at the beginning of 2019, probably the first quarter. So that's going to give us hopefully some confirmation that the amazing results we saw in phase two will continue to be, uh, you know, continue to be seen. And what that would do is that would allow Vertex to pick which whatever those ones looks best and they'll have large enough to be able to really see all the things, everything from safety to effect on lungs to sweat chloride to say this is the one that we're going to move forward and that would be the one that they would submit to the FDA and, that, and what they've uh, talked about is That'll happen probably by mid-2019, unless there's any surprises in the, in the trial. So be saying your prayers that that continues to be successful. That would mean that the FDA would then be looking at that over subsequent months with this question of, okay, should we approve this drug? The FDA has been very involved with this. I have to give them credit. They're very aware. They've had ongoing discussions both with us and with Vertex, and they are trying to help to think about moving more quickly on this. Um, they, they have, would have, if, if things were submitted in June, they would have to make a decision by, by the following February. But I think there have been a lot of signals that they realized that they, there's a lot of eager people and so that they're going to take a look at this and, and try to move. But realistically, they still have to do all the safety analysis and all that. So that's why I think that right now the hope would be that this might be, again, at, if everything's going smoothly, would be approval sort of the end of 2019 maybe the beginning of 2020 if, if things were slow, slower. Um, the next question is, okay, that sounds great, but when could I get access? That's the early access programs. Um, traditionally, remember that when drugs have been shown to be effective and they're being reviewed, that companies work with the FDA to get approval for early access for people who are sick. 
and there's already plans um, to be able to do that. Uh, that usually means FEV1 below 40 percent for people who have been recurrently ill. It's something that takes uh, a couple of months to work through the FDA and then the local IRBs to do, but that may be something that for those people who are particularly sick that by mid-2019 there may be some opportunities there. And um, as I mentioned, there's uh, continuing, actually there's going to be some other triple trials moving on in 2019 from other companies. Um, so incredibly exciting. I mean, I think, truthfully, we could probably stop there, call it a night, go have lunch, and say, wow, that's, that's great. But we want to make sure that we're, uh, uh, you know, get everybody 100%. Um, we want to um, also think about what about people that have existing lung disease. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those things. I'm going to start by mentioning one thing that you may be hearing about in 2019 that I, I, I believe that Hopkins will be uh, participating in, and that is that if the triple does be appro become approved, that we're going to want to make sure that we learn absolutely every aspect of the benefits. Obviously, it's easy to focus on lungs because we know lungs are the area that uh, sort of that's where the money is. But this is a sy systemic, a whole body uh, disease, right? And the good news is this is a whole body therapy. And so there's already big plans to be able to do a study that would say, could we learn a lot when people start this new medication from going from not having the medicine to having it? So what I've just put up here is this is actually one of the largest trials we've ever put together at the foundation. It's a $15 million trial over the next three years. It totally hinges on the triple being successful and approved. But we would actually, we're already preparing to be able to get baselines on people before they're on the medicine and then right afterwards to be able to say what happens in all these areas. So we know that can have effect on mucus, microbiology, being able to clear infection, the liver, the intestines, all the GI symptoms, uh, diabetes, inflammation, uh, anyway, I list all these different things. So it, it's very similar if you've participated or somebody that you love participated in the goal study or the prospect study. But this would be one where this is a unique opportunity to be able to study all the effects of turning on cystic fibrosis at a high level. All right. Um, so I think one of the take-home messages of this is that the triple combination, if it's successful, could mean that more than 90 percent of people with cystic fibrosis could hopefully have an Emily story um, where they said, oh my gosh, I, I suddenly felt so, such a dramatic effect. I will mention, I won't go into it in too much detail, but there are some other mutations that um, would likely benefit from the triple that are more rare. And there'll be some work that will be ongoing to look at which of those would benefit. So obviously f 5 weight del is so common, we tend to focus on that. But the key thing is whether or not the mutations make protein. If they make protein, and there's something there that could be modified, we're going to be looking at that through something called therotyping. But that'll take a little while longer uh, to be able to. But even just with the f 5 weight del and the currently approved, we'll get, over, get to 90%. That last 3% would be those, those uh, little more unusual ones. So, but here's the thing. Seven, that's not good enough, right? There's another 7% that we need to have the exact same story for. And so uh, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about this because I think it gives us a glimpse of the future. These things could help that last 7%, but truth truth, they could help everybody because it doesn't matter what your mutation is for these type of... These are the ones that I sort of call the therapies of tomorrow. There's some of the science fiction things that you say, really, they can do that? Well, we can't do it yet, but part of the idea is to lay the groundwork to be able to to make it, you know, in the past there was a time when we said, oh, we're going to get this little, pro this little molecule and fold the protein and that's going to fix cystic fibrosis. 20 years ago, people said, that's crazy. That'll never happen. That's sort of where we are now with some of these, where we want to actually be able to make sure it's the same story. But a couple other ones which are actually starting into the clinic. So I put this up here just as, you know, more than 50% of all the work we do in our own lab has nothing to do with the 93%. It's actually the last 7% because we know there's more work to do there. Uh, one of our biggest contracts this past year was actually with a company to screen two million compounds to try to help people with stop mutations, people that have X's on the end of their mutations. Um, and so really going hard on that. And um, I'll just zip through this a little bit more just to say, hey, there's a lot going on here. That uh, what we'd like to do would be identify molecules which would allow us to fix or to read through those X mutations that would give us a big chunk of that last 7%. These are some of the specific companies that we're working with. Um, there's also ways of just delivering a correct copy of the DNA or the RNA. And actually, the one that's probably more ahead right now is actually RNA. 
So you see this recode, translate, and Arcturus. These are all companies where it wouldn't matter what mutation you have because you would inhale, or maybe inject, we'll see, but inhale a correct copy of the RNA that would uh, allow the cells to now have the right code to be able to make the cystic fibrosis protein. And so this is actually something, one of these is actually in phase one trials right now. Again, this is just to help understand what it is. The RNA is a copy of the code of how to make uh, the cystic fibrosis protein. It's inside a lipid nanoparticle, a very small inhalable particle which actually penetrates into cells. And so this is actually in phase one healthy volunteers right now and in 2019 we'll be starting into uh, to cystic fibrosis. Um, it's early, it's phase one, um, but it's, it's, it's exciting to see something that's actually getting this close. And then I'll just mention, because I think we always hear about it, gene therapy and gene editing. Just so you know a little bit of what's the difference between gene therapy and gene editing. I think the key thing is gene therapy really is taking a correct copy of the DNA and delivering a correct copy of that DNA to the cells. It's one that we've made, or, um, but it replaces the person's DNA uh, in that area or provides another copy. I should say that, that other DNA is still there, but it, it provides another copy to be able to read off of. Gene editing is different. Gene editing is actually this idea that you could go in and you could edit somebody's DNA. I know it sounds crazy, but you can actually do that with enzymes. It's actually being done in several other diseases right now. Um, part of it is getting it into the right cells. That's part of the challenge, and those are the things that we're working on. This is and sometimes when you hear about a one-time cure or something, that's really what we're talking about is probably gene editing or gene therapy that goes to stem cells. So people actually get treated, and they wouldn't have to take medicines anymore. Again, this wouldn't matter what your mutation is. So that's, that's what we're aiming for. I'm, we're not close to that yet, but uh, we'd love to be here in 20 years from now saying, oh, yeah, we've got the one-time cure. And that the work, we're doing that work now. So um, in terms of the gene therapy and gene editing, I'll just mention that um, there are some programs both in uh, uh, gene therapy that we're working with or actually getting ready to uh, getting closer to the clinic. Um, and then the gene editing, we have a lot of basic science work to do. So that's getting the best scientists together, actually trying to draw in those best scientists to focus on cystic fibrosis because it's a little more challenging. Um, let's talk some about uh, move from modulators to treating complications, what I'd say. And the reason I think this is so important is because we know that even with the modulators, there's a big chunk of our people, uh, people with cystic fibrosis that ha already have scarring in their lungs, right? And that's going to improve, but it's not going to go away. And they have infections. So uh, Emily was commenting about still taking antibiotics and not, you know, still having to deal with infections. We, we know we need new antibiotics, and, and we want to we double team the problems, right? So yes, turn on the cystic fibrosis protein, that's going to change the equation, but aggressively treat these other potential complications. And so you may have heard at the North American Cystic Fibrosis Meeting or seen it on social media that one of the things that we rolled out was just a new and bigger commitment than ever before to developing new anti-infectives. As a matter of fact, over the next five years, committing to $100 million to be able to develop new antibiotics, new approaches. Actually, I, I like this slide better because this actually talks about the details. Um, that this, and Dara's played a big part in this, so Dara, thank you for all your work on this, um, that um, these, yes, antibiotics, but way more than that, sort of a, a starting from um, what's the best way to be able to detect and to diagnose certain types of infections, right? That's a whole topic. How about, um, you know, optimizing current treatments once you do diagnose it, um, developing new treatments that we don't have, and that, um, trying to understand some of the basics of different uh, CF bacteria and fungi. Um, and then the long-term things, what's the future look like? Okay, as we start these modulators, we're going to be able to clear infection. Um, with, uh, are we going to be able to uh, get a better feel for what's the effects of taking long-term antibiotics on other things like the gut microbiome? And so this is, uh, anyway, there's a lot going on in this space. I'll let's mention one or two things. So this was already something we were really working on in quite a bit. But there's going to be, stay tuned. There's a lot to come. This is just, I don't have time to go through all of this, but this is just a, a list of some of the current companies that we're supporting that um, to move forward with new therapies related to infection. And I know it's a little bit confusing, but you can sort of see the categories based on the colors. 
and uh, everything that's from MRSA treatment uh, with Savara to some medicines, potential medicines, which really treat almost anything. Inhaled nitric oxide, it doesn't matter what the bacteria is, and gallium has some potential as well for being broad spectrum. Uh, an antifungal, this one in black's an interesting one. This is actually, we put it in the anti-infectives, but we know that there's some of the medicines, the aminoglycosides, which can affect hearing over time from recurrent treatment. And so there's actually three different companies right now that are looking at technologies or, or therapies which uh, can either prevent the damage from tobramycin when you take it IV or amikacin um, or actually restore hearing is one of the companies. So obviously we're very interested in that. Um, I'm going to specifically mention uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, NTM. And that's basically this is ab uh, what you also hear called abscessus or MAC are two of those subgroups of NTM. This, this is something we know is increasing, and it's, it's still less than 15% of people with cystic fibrosis, but we see the numbers have increased. Abscessus is hard to treat. So uh, over the last couple of years, we've uh, committed a, a good number of resources, and um, starting off with saying, let's make sure that we can actually get the best treatment of what we have. And so the NTM consortium is a group of uh, uh, sites that are really focusing and specializing on CF NTM infection. And Hopkins is one of those. The studies that they're doing are called PREDICT in patients, and the PREDICT one is who do we need to treat? Because sometimes you can have a culture, but you don't actually need to treat it. If you do need to treat, what's the right way? Patients is what it's called because this takes a lot of, this takes uh, a year of treatment oftentimes. Um, but there's four different New NTM trials are going to be starting in 2019. Uh, if anybody's really interested in this, I'm happy to go through it afterwards and talk to you about it. But this is something that we had a big meeting in, in the uh, summer with actually everybody in this picture as well as some other outside experts to say, how are we going to make sure that we prevent, prevent this from becoming a real increasing problem in cystic fibrosis? We do know that the modulators help in this area. We've seen this, but we know we're going to need some additional treatments as well. Um, and just to highlight how much is going on in this space, I think this is a DARA slide. I might have stole this from DARA. Um, that um, this is looking back at just all the CF complications, and this is really looking at our research grants. So not so much the companies that we work with, but research grants, um, everything from better treatment to understanding. We already, if you look at the yellow one, that skyrocketing one, there was over 100 or about 100 uh, uh, anti-infective grants already, and that was before we committed this $100 million. And so um, this is an area that we're going to really be uh, trying to make progress on because we want that as a complement because people still have, still have some infection issues until we can treat people really young and prevent it from ever happening. All right? Um, a couple other highlights here, and then we'll uh, maybe do whatever, a couple other highlights. So um, there was some progress this last year in inflammation. So we know, just like the infection can continue to be a problem, even when you're on modulators, unfortunately, once there's scarring in the lungs and there's infection, even on modulators, it continues to be inflammation. You were talking about this as you were talking about your diet. And so um, there's actually, uh, this is a list of a couple of the different companies. I will tell you that there is, we've probably talked to 50 different companies with anti-inflammatories who want to do them in cystic fibrosis. So we got together a group of experts to help us select the four most promising you can only do so many things at once. And so the four trials which are ongoing uh, or being uh, programs which are really going to move forward right now are Corbis, Celtaxis, Laurent, and Santhera. Corbis has finished its phase two and will be starting a phase three. The phase two showed that it actually reduced the frequency of exacerbations. And so people who had existing lung disease, when they took this, they actually got, got sick less. Cell taxes showed something similar in more mild patients, and they'll be, they're thinking about what they're going to do in terms of phase three in 2019 as well. And then earlier phase two trials, one is Laurent, which actually is a, uh, it's an agent which treats some of the, the fatty acid imbalance that we see in cystic fibrosis, which we know can lead to, to uh, increase in inflammation. And this other one is uh, an inhibitor, a very potent inhibitor of what we call neutrophil elastase. Why is that important? So neutrophil elastase comes from neutrophils. Neutrophils are the white cells which gives you dark sputum. So when you have green sputum or a lot of sputum, that's actually those neutrophils there that have actually released their contents, which is great because it has uh, 
factors which kill bacteria. That's the way you control it. But they also have factors which can damage the lungs. So what we'd like to be able to do is to keep those factors which kill the bacteria but inhibit those ones that damage the lungs. All right? And so I'll just mention a couple other ones, and then we can try to wrap up and do some questions. I just thought these were other ones you might want to take home with you. So one is Galaxy. Uh, this is another DARA project um, that... Um, that's right, exactly. Um, that uh, we know that GI is a big issue, right, when we've, when we've talked to people, that symptoms, GI symptoms, uh, from everybody, we're talking about DIOS, the DIOS. Um, this is something particularly in adults, and so this is a study that's starting to look at symptoms and potential treatments, particularly for, for, for uh, DIOS and um, constipation. Um, Check SC, which is a big study, we're trying to understand how changes in sweat chloride that come from these modulators, remember we said these modulators are decreasing sweat chloride a whole bunch, how that actually correlates with how much better patients feel and how much better the patients do over time. So this is a big study looking at that and then correlating it with the registry. So we'd love to be able to know down the road that if you change your sweat chloride 50 points, that means that over the next five years your FEV1 is going to do this or that. So, um, and uh, GROW, which is a, a oral glutathione that's specifically looking at potentially something that can help with growth. And then I'll just mention one of my favorite studies is STOP2. My bet is that there's a bunch of people in here who have participated in STOP trial. Um, Hopkins is actually one of the largest enrollers in this in the country. Um, that I know Natalie West is leading that here on the adult side. Um, but I just thought I would mention it why I think it's exciting because it's going to affect how long people get treated with IV antibiotics. And just as a reminder, what this is, is everybody in this trial, it's about a thousand exacerbations. So we're going to, the whole question is how long should we be treating people with IV antibiotics? And the way it works is everybody who starts gets a repeat PFT after about five days. And they say, are they getting better already? If they are, they're considered to be early responders. And they're getting randomized to either 10 days or 14 days. The whole idea is maybe not everybody needs to do your standard two weeks of IV antibiotics. There's another group that after five days, they say, I'm not feeling better. My PFTs aren't any better. These are what we call delayed responders. And so that group, they're being randomized to 14 or 21 because the question really is, would they benefit from going longer? And so that, the final endpoint then is actually two weeks after the end of treatment, how do those groups compare? And so we think that probably we'll have the results of this in 2020, but 2019 it'll finish enrolling. But this is going to tell us what's the right amount of time in many people. And I think that this might become more and more of a standard of let's check and see how you're doing with that initial treatment part, and that can help guide us. Um, think about the number of days around the, around the world that may cut down in terms of IV antibiotics, hospital days. Um, that's why I think this is such an exciting trial. I'll just mention lung transplant because obviously there's a big spectrum. Uh, we also want to make sure we don't, uh, we're not paying, or that we pay extra attention to people who have severe lung disease and not just focus on modulators. And so um, there's a whole lung transplant consortium that's been formed, a CF lung transplant consortium. Hopkins is part of that and actually playing a big role. And the whole idea there is best care, best practices, and then as a basis to be able to do research, which actually is just being started into now. Um, and then the last thing I think was mentioned a little bit, and I was getting at, at Dr. Paranjapay's question a little bit as well about getting feedback from people with cystic fibrosis and their families about what's important. And I can tell you that we've started every year, and hopefully you've felt this, uh, at the foundation we've really been trying to, to be better listeners than ever before. And um, some of this is surveys, some of this is advisory groups, but this is actually um, one that uh, was a question that said, other than modulators, because we know that everybody thinks modulators are important, and the ones that are going to fix CFTR, what are the other things that we should be concentrating on? And the overwhelming uh, number one answer was actually infection. And this was, these were some of the results which led us to say we're going to dive into the infection research initiative and make that so. But it's interesting if you look at some of these other ones, reducing treatment burden. People want to say, hey, if I take this new medicine, do I have to continue to take two hours of treatment twice a day or whatever, particularly if I'm ill? Um, so there's going to be some studies looking at that, you know, let's get, the, let's get the triple on board, but there's going to be some specific studies, a study called Simplify, which might try to say, could we actually take away some medicines? Wouldn't that be a concept? Um, and the GI symptoms, and we see the other ones here, but the whole idea here is to be able to get feedback from the community about what's important. Oh, I recognize somebody in this picture. Um, that um, the um, other thing is 
just getting as, uh, input on every aspect of cystic fibrosis research. So if you're interested in providing uh, input uh, at cff.org, there is uh, something called Community Voice. It's a group that you can join that basically gives us advice on these different things. There's also something called Research Voice, which is a subset of people with particular interest in research. And they actually do everything from help a uh, subset of them review protocols to uh, advise our IRB, uh, our, sorry, our DSMB, as well as the central IRB. Um, and uh, anyway, it's just an opportunity to continue to make sure that the, the voice of people with cystic fibrosis is embedded in everything we do. And then the last one I just put up here, it's not truly research, but I thought it was a big deal in 2018. You know, I think one of the things that we really wanted to make sure was that um, people with cystic fibrosis get access to new medications, that they are not excluded from having affordable and accessible uh, and adequate insurance. And so uh, another big part of this, uh, and was coupled, has been a team that has been on the Hill looking at every time and saying, what can we do to make sure that when we have these great breakthroughs, that people are going to have access to them. And this is actually a, a shot of one of my favorite days of the year. This is a March on the Hill, the teen March on the Hill. So these are all SIBs. Um, of people with cystic fibrosis who um, came basically to advocate for their, uh, for their brother or their sister so they could, and uh, you know, in some ways it gives them a chance one time to be a little bit of a star and to be able to be the focus and to really, uh, so, you know, I, I think the goal of all this obviously is to transform CF. CF of the future is going to look different. We know that the number of adults with cystic fibrosis is going to skyrocket, that the, the pediatric population is hopefully going to look less and less sick, right, as we treat earlier and earlier. That this, this is what we want, and we want lots and lots of these types of pictures, right? Or maybe without the nebulizer, that would probably even be better. Um, so um, I think you can see why 2018 has been so exciting. You know, it's, there's advances on a bunch of different areas. Truth of the thing that we've been waiting for for 20 years, which is really this highly effective therapy, is to the gotten through phase two and is now in phase three. Um, but I think 2019 really does have potential to be uh, even significantly better. So with that, I'll sort of wrap up. Happy to take suggestions, questions, uh, comments. I don't know if Peter, you want to say anything else right now uh, before. Um, but anyway, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yes. Okay, good. Well, that's that's. So kind of going back to one of Emily's comments um, about like retirement funds. Okay. You want stock tips? Is that what you want? No, that's right. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. But with these modulators and with people with CF living longer, the foundation involved in long-term life planning for people. That's actually a very good question. Um, so. Okay, the question really was, hey, you know what, if, if the CF really does start to change and really look that much different where people do think about, have to think about retirement funds, and the answer is that's what absolutely is the goal, and I think we're, we're getting closer and closer to that, is there a potential for the foundation to be able to support other aspects such as long-term planning or life planning? So, you know, the answer is there is a service that can absolutely help with that. I have to say it's not the number one thing on the list there. Um, that one of those things is uh, compass at the foundation. Basically, if you really have questions or concerns that relate to anything like this, um, they have a team of counselors, uh, financial counselors, lawyers. Um, it's one eight four four compass. The other thing is your care center. So your social worker, uh, which obviously is a great resource. Um, I think particularly on the adult side that this is things you're starting to actually think a little bit more about is sort of, um, you know, it used to be really a focus on disability. Now there's been much more about job stuff than ever before. Um, but, you know, I think there's probably some opportunity for us to, to think about doing even more in those areas. And education, we always think about what are the, you know, what are the education messages. And so I would say that there are some opportunities here, but there's uh, room to do more in that area. And I guess it's a nice thing to be thinking about. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so the question I think is, is just a good one, which is incredibly exciting. Modulators sound good, but the, the, right now we're talking about something that you take for the rest of your life. 
what are we doing now to be able to demonstrate that this is safe and that there's not other unknown problems? So I think there's two parts to this. So, you know, the truth is the whole reason the FDA has this incredible review process and then they require what they call post-marketing studies is to help address this question, which is, um, that sounds great, all the data looks good, but what about going forward? So, you know, even now Vertex actually has continuous safety monitoring that they're required to do. They actually use our registry. So when you enter data into, um, uh, you know, or allow your care center to enter data into the registry, what that does is that goes into some safety monitoring. So we can see who's on, and it allows us to really get a very clear uh, picture over time. And the reason I say that is because a lot of drug monitoring programs, they tend to pick on a couple of things they're worried about. The registry, you know how comprehensive that is, right? So, um, so uh, each year, uh, we actually, as part of this, we've worked with the FDA and with Vertex on this, they actually get a readout on the safety, basically a bunch of key safety signals related to anybody who's on Kaleidico or Cambi and Simdico across all these different areas that are collected. So really the biggest thing we do is to be able to collect data and to watch really closely on an ongoing basis. Um, I don't know if we can do anything else to predict, you know, and, but I can tell you they're going to be way, way better off being on this. I mean, infinitely better off being in office. But you're right. I think that's something we're going to continue. We never want to completely fall asleep. The good news is Kaleidico is over five years now, and there haven't been any, there haven't been any surprises there. As a matter of fact, some of the early concerns have been dismissed. Um, and I'll tell you another one that's a hot topic right now. What about the role of modulators in pregnancy? This is going to be the future, right? We're going to have, this will be great, but we'll have healthy, uh, healthy young women uh, on modulators who are asking about pregnancy. And so we know some of the information from animal studies, but there's already some efforts to try to be able to collect experiences. And there's never going to be a pregnancy trial. It's just there never will be. But trying to collect some of that to be able to provide some guidance, because that's another safety area as well. So yes? Yeah, so, okay, well, so, you know, I think the thing that's going to, and this is going to be probably, Peter will be up here talking about this at some point in the future. We're really going to go into a brave new world of what would CF look like if you started treating it at the time that somebody was diagnosed right after newborn screening. Because there's some evidence you can actually rescue the pancreas, right? So there's some evidence right now that people who have started this early, actually their pancreas, they don't need enzymes initially or they need less. And that's the earlier you treat, the better you could. The other question would be about diabetes. Can we prevent diabetes if you actually treat early enough so that people never have enough pancreatic damage? But the reason I, was, I brought this up is because what about the vas deferens, right? So the vas deferens is the, the, the reason for male infertility. Um, it's interesting, the vas deferens actually develops normally, we found, but then it actually gets resorbed. And so the tube, which would carry the sperm, doesn't actually fully, isn't fully developed. And so, could, we, could there be, find the right timing where if we treat it early enough, we could actually prevent you know, male infertility? So this, this is speculative, right? And this is a way down the road, but that's the whole reason. It's gonna be a, a fascinating world when we treat early enough so that we might change what CF looks like, f particularly the pancreas and some of these other things. Um, so you know, I don't know if I answered your question or not. It's uh, that uh, in terms of, being on a modulator and fathering kids, that's not, there's no evidence that that's a, an issue at all. Yes? I just want to say how uh, I've been a bit disoriented by this whole thing and how much I appreciate the doctors and the people here. When we first started coming here, the, we had the, the lawyer from Texas that got up here and told us how we could get our kids onto Medicare early on, and then we went to Congress for that, and when I, that picture reminded me, we were in a room full of parents, and their, their children had passed away, and their mm. children passed away young, and now today we're talking about having children, you know, yeah. being grandparents, and all these things. Yeah. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate all you've all done. The people mm. dedicate your life to yeah, yeah. Dr. Rosenstein. When yes, I yeah. Here. <laughs> I, just, I just want to thank you guys. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Emily, will be like, give, Emily will be giving a history lesson. Let me tell you what it was like. <laughs> um, but uh, last year we were talking, I mean, especially in the news, we were talking a lot about CRISPR and, uh, uh, you know, you touched on it with gene editing. Is, it, um, is CRISPR still something that is uh, in terms
interesting to us? Or yes. Okay, yeah, no, it's a great question. So the question really is some of the new technologies, things like CRISPR, which is a, one of the versions of gene editing, is that something that could be of significance in cystic fibrosis? And the answer is absolutely. Um, just to understand why, so you're going to be hearing in other diseases a lot of advances. Um, you're already hearing about some of these um, with gene editing. But the tricky part is you need, we have the enzymes to be able to edit the DNA. I know you know this, but the, the DNA. But a lot of times it's trying to get it into the right cells and to be able to, you know, to target those. So the diseases that are getting moving forward quickly in this, some of these, for instance, are blood disease disorders. We can actually draw blood out of somebody, get cells, edit those, and just put them right back into people. That's a little harder in lungs. And the other thing is we don't, with lungs, there's a, you know, with the, the bone marrow, you could actually target the bone marrow. If that's corrected, then that continues to make healthy cells. And that may be something we see for sickle cell, for instance, down the road. Um, cystic fibrosis is, is harder in this because the lungs uh, are turning over a lot. If you actually could get into the lungs, you'd have to say, okay, which cells do we need to get? If you do get those cells, those cells, just like your skin, turn over over time. And so you'd have to target the stem cells, which would actually be populating the lungs. And so those are all things we've had a lot of theoretical discussions on. And truthfully, what we're trying to do is to make sure that because cystic fibrosis is more of a challenge, that the best people don't all go elsewhere. So with gene therapy, it's something similar. The lungs are um, really good at fighting off virus. You know, thank goodness, otherwise we'd be sick constantly. But that makes it hard when we put in new DNA into the lungs. The lungs quickly recognizes, hey, this isn't us, and they attack it and get rid of it. Um, other diseases, such as liver disease, where the, the liver is sterile and doesn't have this whole defense mechanism, or the retina, um, are some ones that there's, you're going to be seeing a lot more success. So that, this was, it was a bit of a long answer, but I think it's to, we need to actually do a couple things. We need to solve some of those targeting problems. And so really what we've done is we actually had um, hired a firm to spend and just go out and say, tell us all the technology that's out there for delivering to cells and targeting cells, because that's the hard part in CF. And so what we're trying to do is to lay the groundwork. Truthfully, though, probably some of the breakthroughs are going to come in other diseases as opposed to a lot of things where cystic fibrosis always leads the way because it's easier. But then we want to be in a situation to take that and be able to immediately plug it in or to plug it in to be able to benefit CF. So absolutely, that's the long-term plan. Um, but we've got some work to do. So, yes? So Laura? But it's not. Yes, I know. Yeah. Well, so Laura, I, I hear you, and I, I think hopefully you've seen all along what we've done is that literally every time we talk about modulators, we automatically, as an, as immediately, talk about it's not enough, right? So you want to be we may be excited, and so uh, a big part of this has been to uh, to, to with the messaging to make clear about it. We have way bigger goals than just these modulators, as exciting as they are, that. Um, the things like the one-time cure and the gene therapy and gene editing, that's for everybody. That's not just for the last 7%. So part of this is making people realize, hey, we've still got work to do. And I can tell you part of this is uh, keeping, uh, keeping volunteers engaged by building the relationships, letting them realize. I, and I have to say that, and you can tell me if you're wrong, but people who have been involved in, uh, in this cause they are still in. They're into the finish, right? They're in for you and, yeah. Um, I, they are going to be. I can tell you that I, I bet you everybody in this room is, right? It, it, it's, so, I hear you. That's a good one. Yeah, if you, I would only say if you have other suggestions, or, well, so something we think about, uh, you know, we're going to wrap up right now, that we actually have a triple, a triple working group right now, which has four different areas. One of these is, okay, how are we going to roll out and make sure people know how to use this? How are we going to make sure people have access? Another one is called community fragmentation, or it's community effects, and it's specifically to be able to say, how do we make sure that the incredible community that we have right now continues to, to plow forward to get to the finish line, not two-thirds of the way.
So. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, um, Sue, do you want to uh, talk about whoever from your team is here today? And uh, so, so, Sue is uh, from the Maryland chapter of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and obviously um, uh, a great team. I mean, I was, I, they, they were my home team when I was here, and now we're sort of changed the team. Yeah, now, not really my home team. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, Sue, do you want to introduce anybody you have with you today? Oh, yes, Sue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we have a yeah, we have a lot of people. Um, I think the donors will be here a little later today, but we have a lot of people who volunteer for the Maryland chapter. Our board is one. Yes. Behind, and they're longtime volunteers. We love to see the parents. Um, Laura and Lee Thomasell. Uh, All right. Plus, um, we have James Seymour, who is into the end. I mean, Laura, I have to tell you, we're all into the end reading. Yes. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and, yeah. and I will tell you that some of our actually, if you look at some of the people who are most, I was just talking to your point before, but you know, I think about Joe O'Donnell. I don't know if people know who Joe is, but Joe is somebody who's actually probably the person who made a lot of this story possible because he, he helped raise about $250 million, which actually was the thing that got this going. Um, he's also the chair of the, uh, the Harvard board. Um, He's a billionaire. His son died 30 years ago. He, he's done all this afterwards. And so I think those are the type of people who are going to stay committed no matter what, right? And so we're going to get it. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. 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 So we've actually been in. I'm sorry. The question was really about the five feet apart. It's like five feet apart, which is this movie that's about CF and. Um, I'm trying to remember the company that, uh, it's, it's one of the big movie companies, but they actually did approach, approach us, and uh, we had basically said, hey, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a little hard for us to do much when you actually don't know what the movie says. Um, so uh, that, um, a couple of things. Um, they did actually try to get uh, some expertise in. I think they had a person with cystic fibrosis as well as a, a nurse that they are trying to, what we've got some reassurance about, because really what we were up front was we were worried that they were going to basically downplay it or say that infection control is ridiculous. We just thought that would be really unhealthy. So our initial concern was actually um, were there negative things. But they actually were very good and said, no, th th this is actually going to be a very upbuilding movie from what we heard, um, that it's, uh, it doesn't, it actually probably stresses the importance of, of being wise in your decisions in life. It's been a, so the, the, our view of it was is you know what if it if, if it celebrates people with cystic fibrosis and it doesn't do anything damaging this might be an okay thing this might be a good thing I know this it's always a little hard to to make past judgment though until you actually see what the movie shows and so in terms of the money part there might be for different nonprofits there might be some opportunities for that we've been a little hesitant to dive in again not having seen everything and so um, my hope and our message was. Uh, yes, there's certain things we know are really important. At the same time, if, it's, if it brought people to, uh, awareness of the challenges of cystic fibrosis and the heroes that people with CF are, that'd be great. So, um, well, thank you. Yes. Thanks.